Okay, so let me begin by thanking the Vyas Chavan Center. Uh, Supriyaji, who could not make it today, but for thanks to hosting this event, and Kumar Kethkarji, who I'm sure has a very busy schedule, but has made time for this uh, dialogue today evening, uh, and others who have been working, Purva, and of course, my friend Yogesh, who has been taking great care of me since I've come here in spite of, and thanks to this beautiful audience, we've all been here in spite of this scorching heat, Mumbai heat that has been sapping our energies since I've arrived in Mumbai. So let me begin by <coughs> asking this the question for today is as to why has the world become so illiberal? I think many of us in this room would by and large agree to this point that something in the world uh, is changing in very unknown ways. Uh, you know, something is extremely discomforting, you know, the dialogue that we all had sitting outside uh, that uh, it's, it's now in our face that there is a sense of growing illiberality. Uh, we refer to it in our everyday parlance in different words of uh, growing hatred, there's growing intolerance. Uh, and this uh, is, is, is in fact a global phenomenon. There's, it's not unique to India. I think the rise of Trump and his anti-immigrant positions, the locker room dialogue that all of us were privy to, uh, no, before his election, he got elected in spite of that leakage of locker room uh, dialogue. Uh, Bolsonaro, election of Bolsonaro in Brazil. Interestingly, I was in Brazil when uh, in the run up to the elections, and I could see firsthand the kind of excitement uh, among common people with uh, Bolsonaro's candidature. Uh, in fact, I was doing an international project and I was going around asking people as to what is the thing, one thing that, they excite, that excited them so much about Bolsonaro. And you wouldn't believe many of them said that it is uh, one thing that he announced that one is anti-homosexual positions that he took very in his uh, very rather ugly kind of a language. The other was he announced that uh, the first thing he would do as after being elected as a president that, that he would himself hang uh, drug lords, but as a president he would be a hangman that he would directly, and this imagination of the president himself being directly ha hangman who would, you know, execute criminals, uh, you know, excited people, you know, that uh, in, in I used to meet a lot of them during, in, in evenings during in my uh, pub visits, and the mention of Bolsonaro, some of them would break into dance, you know, they said that this is the man we were waiting for all through, and uh, we finally heard. Uh, Turkey, and we are closely keeping a watch on what's happening in Turkey with Erdogan's uh, uh, results. I was in Turkey a couple of months back and there is a similar kind of jubilation with uh, Mr. Erdogan's uh, presidentship. Uh, the dominant Sunni Muslims are very strongly behind and the reason they feel is he's a very strong, ma they say he's a masculine president. So that's what the shopkeepers told me, that why they love Erdogan so much. And of, of course, in unstated ways, anti-Kurdish position that is, you know, nothing to hide. You know, it's in your face kind of a thing. And question of Germany, that, you know, if some of you would recollect that not long back in Cologne, there was a, a neo-Nazi march, a very big march that took place uh, in Cologne uh, with slogans of, uh, that were fairly racist and anti-immigrant calling for mass genocidal violence. Uh, in, even in social democratic welfare countries like Sweden, you know, that uh, you had uh, the anti-immigrant rights, which we thought that these, at the Scandinavian countries figured very high on welfare and there was a fair amount of harmony and, you know, these countries uh, uh, are relatively stable nations. Even there, there were impromptu rights that broke, broke up. And what to speak of India, I think you all know better than me that what, uh, that many scholars have been referring to India as increasingly converting itself into a kind of an electoral autocracy or ethnic democracy. That's the way scholars have been responding to. So there is no running away from the fact that increasingly democracies across globe, you know, irrespective of they being developed, underdeveloped, uh, whether they're part of the global north or global south, uh, there is something happening to democracies that uh, we don't uh, completely understand. Uh, I strongly believe that old categories in which we have framed questions of democracy uh, don't really explain this, uh, this global phenomenon. Uh, 
Uh, there must be other reasons that one should really look for uh, what is it that why or why is it that world has become so illiberal? There must be some reasonings that it is one thing to offer a moral critique and you know feel this great discomfort with uh, illiberality that that we all do anyways. But uh, there is no point in stopping there. One has to go beyond to explain that what could be the possible reasons that uh, that it's, it, it it might be somewhat a historical to say that people across globe have suddenly become very intolerant or suddenly have started to learn to hate. So, so that's not how societies change. There must be something brewing in societies that uh, has culminated in something which is so visible uh, and which is also so visceral in, in terms of its uh, hatred uh, politics. So the points that I trace here uh, broadly would inform you about my trajectory. My recent book uh, titled Politics, Ethics and Emotions in New India also partly, so my work for last few years uh, has been in terms of mapping and tracking this kind of a global shift. Uh, I do political theory kind of work, but I'm not going to bore you with theoretical formulations today evening. Uh, keep it pretty lucid in terms of uh, 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 communicating as to the basic thrust of the uh, points and formulations that have made. By and large, we would all also agree, I think, Liberal values, as we understood, in terms of broadly, in popular parlance, we understand them as constitutional values, you know, what Ambedkar referred to as constitutional morality, you know, uh, broadly in terms of equal moral worth, uh, sense of mutuality and reciprocity, uh, rule of law, separation of powers, protection for minority rights, certain celebration of equality, liberty, human rights, autonomy of institutions, all of this across globe in one way or the other is under stress. Uh, as Gramsci once said, old is dying, but the new is yet to born. You know, so that they, we do not know where we are heading head towards. And this has nothing to do with governments and certain political parties being voted in and voted out. I think this is a tectonic sociological change that, has, uh, that is coming across globe. And I think there are new questions being raised uh, which we will need to address, you know, that it is not just an electoral thing that if you move, push out certain political parties, I mean, already Trump has, is, is out, Bolsonaro is out, for all you know, Erdogan might be out, uh, we are all also, as you know, waiting with breath at weight of 2024, 20, what is going to happen in India, <laughs> hopefully uh, Turkey and US will repeat in India, but we don't know. But the point is that it's not merely about these electoral outcomes, I mean, these are short-term symptoms that will come and go, but uh, there are, I think, we'll have to address whichever political party with whatever ideological persuasion comes with, there are, I think, long-term uh, sociological changes which we will have to take head on. So those are the five. There are a lot more I trace in my book, but I prefer to put this, uh, these four or five points for your consideration. One, I think globally, culture has come back in a very big way. You know, democracy, we usually spoke about uh, through political economy frame. To polit we talk talked either about excessive about institutions or we spoke more about questions of economic justice, you know, that uh, social justice is one issue that we always discussed. But somewhat distinct from these, I think, uh, culture is now hit uh, right in our face, that we'll have to deal with culture and uh, these are cultural questions, but it's also a little more complex. It is a cultural framing of questions of economic justice and uh, political uh, questions. So one, why is culture uh, big in such a big way? You know, I would refer you to uh, this English scholar, very interesting book, The Road to Somewhere, you know, David Goodhart. You know, he makes a very interesting formulation. I use it in some of my work. He says, that no longer globally at some point in 50s, he says, uh, economic inequalities were the key defining fault line across globe. You know? uh, we also divided nations in terms of their development, you know, global north, global south, core and periphery. If you, some of you are aware of these were the terminologies that were in global circulations in terms of uh, defining nations where they belong. Uh, class was a very big category. Social structures, very big gender, race. But he says something unique has happened with the turn of the century in 2000. And, and he says the new global fault line is between what he refers to as somewheres and anywheres. Somewheres, he says, are those who are territorially bound, 
culturally rooted. It could be ethnic, it could be national identities, it could be local identities, it could be linguistic identities. And he gives very interesting strategies that even in an advanced capitalist country like Britain, 60% of British people still live within 20 miles of where they lived when they were born, where their forefathers lived. So people don't prefer to move out beyond 20 miles radius. This is the lot which sees life through the lens of ascriptive identities, identities that they're born into, in terms of cultural, local uh, you know, preference. Then there is a tiny minority which he calls anywheres. Perhaps many of us in this room would you know, belong to that anywheres, which he says is the open cosmopolitan liberal elites. Who, is, who are willing to, who are open for intercultural mixing, who are open to speak other languages, who are open to travel across the globe like many of us do. Uh, we are curious about other cultures and cuisines, like when I travel I often would want to eat local food. No, I don't go searching for idlis when I go <laughs> to Europe <laughs> or <coughs> I see many of my relations when they come to Delhi. They compel me to take idli. I tell them, Yaha pe bhi aake idli khana chato. They say, Nahi, idli khana hai sham ko. So you can see this is the uh, difference that some who are closed, who have a finite identities in terms of cultural lifestyle. They have complete discomfort with any new culture, you know, intervening. Then there is a tiny cosmopolitan uh, who became over a period of time through constitutional means the new kind of social elites, you know, that they're open, they're cosmopolitan, and they are the ones who were who the social base of liberal values. They're the ones who, I think, opened up uh, societies and kind of privileged this global modernist view that, you know, it's good to be cosmopolitan, it's good to be open, it's good to be, you know, intermixing, that we are all open even for inter-caste or inter-religious uh, marriages. That was a kind of the vision uh, what this has led to is that modernity has pushed, you know, what many philosophers from beginning with Nietzsche to Heidegger refer to as a sense of being uprooted. I think large sections of social groups, large cultural groups, simply are unable to cope with the pace of global change at the rate in which uh, nation states are changing, the rate in which a post-Westphalian order has come, the rate in which we are all now introduced to a in kind of a global village, we are told we are all part of, that at one hand we celebrate that idea of global village, but deep beneath I think there is a deep discomfort in terms of the pace of change that uh, globalization is uh, bringing. Uh, and it is this bulk, it's only that tiny lot which is comfortable, which kind of celebrates that opening, but it is a majority of these somewheres. Somewheres by somewheres, he means somewheres who are who have a belonging to some place. They are the ones who are extremely uncomfortable with this kind of collapsing of national cultural uh, boundaries. Uh, what this has also done, I think, is that modernity has pushed through constitutional, legal, institutional means certain kind of legal rationality, certain kind of a modernist rationality. Uh, which has led to what cultural socialist Jigmet Bauman says, that all that liberalism expects us is to have ad hoc commitments in life. Everything in one sense has become very contractual. While this, some ways, do not believe in that modern rationality, do not believe in ad hoc commitments, but they are looking for very deep sense of belonging. They are looking for very authentic sense of belonging. They are not, they are looking for deep faith, something to trust very deeply, you know, that urge to trust something very deeply, uh, which is, I think, getting expressed through the rise of, uh, you know, babas and cult, you know, religious figures. Uh, this entire change in the political domain that, uh, you know, from representation we have moved to identification, that we identify with the leader. We don't think leader is a representative of our demands, but we deeply identify. So by and large, my first formulation would be that it is this deep sense, urge for deep sense of belonging, 
that people are looking for, an authentic kind of living, you know, a direct kind of a living, uh, uh, where they can, in, in, a, in an unadulterated way, trust something, put their faith on something. By itself, it may not be a very illiberal thing to do that. So this is the first question that we'll have to think that it is by and large the failure of modernity that uh, this, this search and this urge for deep sense of belonging uh, is being somewhere uprooted, is, some, is being destabilized and disturbed. And this is where I think right-wing political mobilizations get a deep sense, and I think a very correct sense that this is what is going on in the world, and therefore they convert that search for sense of belonging into jingoism, into hyper-nationalism, into... So for our critique of right, our critique of illiberality should not miss this deeper point. So what often happens is that the moment social elites and cosmopolitans like us begin to call the entire process as being very illiberal, uh, then you miss the source. That actually further deepens the anxiety, cultural anxieties of these groups who wish to be local, authentic, speak uh, no, local flavor. So my first question to you would be, I will raise questions and leave it at that uh, for you to come back and we could kind of discuss on this that. Uh, so I see what at the, one of the big sources of this illiberality is a deep sense of belonging. That if we fail to look into that reasoning and simply dismiss the entire thing as being some kind of intolerance and hatred, and uh, illiberality, I think we will be throwing the baby with the bathwater. So how do we retrieve, uh, how do we offer people that deep sense of belonging without that sense of belonging being necessarily, uh, you know, uh, uh, intolerant, toxic majoritarianism, without it being casteist, without it being masculine? So that's the question. So all these, to my mind, I think are distorted forms of search for belonging. And therefore, the larger project that we should be, those of us who are on the, uh, would want to identify as progressive, social democratic, left, uh, broadly centrist, so on and so forth, will have to plug into these deeper sociological, historical, and conceptual trajectories and histories uh, if you want to move away from this illiberal uh, kind of politics. So my first proposition would be that's one major source of uh, illiberality. Second major source of illiberality is something that has very interesting thing that has happened uh, in the world in the last 30, 40 years is uh, a kind of a deep tension and contestation between a process of social democratization with shrinking economic opportunities. I think by and large, many of us sitting here would agree that an imagination of social equality I think has reached all nook and cranny of the world. I think today uh, there would be no acceptance if somebody were to claim a natural superiority of caste or gender or race or you know, things of that kind. You could also see in our everyday interactions that subaltern castes and groups no longer take uh, misbehavior. You know, even routine incivility is being resisted. You know, you can't talk down to auto drivers, taxi drivers, you know. They, they respond back. You know, it doesn't matter how rich and how well off and how powerful you are. If you misbehave with people, you know, bearers. In, in, it, I mean, when I saw with, when I was a child, when we used to go with our parents, it was a very routine affair to talk down towards, you know, all these uh, subaltern cars. But today, they resist. So I think a sense of dignity a question of self-respect, uh, uh, a question of legitimate recognition, uh, the right to be treated with dignity, whether it's women, whether it is uh, people coming from non-caste Hindu backgrounds, uh, I think it's very, very clear, it's very, very distinct. So I think there has been a large scale across globe, a very entrenched process of social democratization. And I say that there are three reasons why the social democratization has happened. One, I think massive spread of education in the last 30, 40, 50 years. You know, even if you take statistics in India, there has been a steady rise in the literacy rate in India. It has grown from 61% in 2001 to 74.37% in 2018. And it is, the figures are much higher if you go to Europe and other parts of the world. So the literacy rates, I think, have gone up a lot. And education in Indian case, as we know, uh, is one big 
tool for social mobility. It's not merely a tool for employment. It's not merely a tool for skills, as Skill India program uh, wish, want us to understand that education is not merely a basic skill here. So education is a big escape route to, you know, from social uh, maladies, and it's actually a route for uh, social emancipation and social mobility. So spread of education, and perhaps one reason why uh, there is so much of crisis in education sector today under the current government, both primary education, 2018 report says more than 71,000 primary government schools have got closed down across India. And just when over 11,000 private schools have opened up. So if you look at the data, it's very, very startling. And all of us are privy to the deep crisis in higher education institutions uh, across India. Uh, uh, coming from JNU, you know, you are hearing from horse's mouth that how higher education institutions of premium quality have uh, been treated under this uh, regime. But interesting part is that it is not restricted to one government. I come from a state of Telangana, and you all know from in, in Maharashtra, I was talking to Yogesh, education funding is in deep crisis across states in India. It is across cutting across all governments, whether they're centrist, whether they're left, whether they're right, whatever parties they might be, there's a huge fund crisis for education. And that's what something it has to do with this link between education and process of uh, social democratization as to why this education is such a big... And uh, if you read details, I'm not going to go into the details of national education policy, you would know what the long-term vision of uh, education is, to, is at, at one basic level is to cut off that link between education and social democratization. Second big reason, I think, spread of market and technology. I think spread of market is today pretty much complete uh, in India. You know, 30 years back, I think we didn't have market. The bankers sitting here who should tell us more on this, that 30, 40 years, India was not so integrated with big roads being built, infrastructural growth. Uh, I see my own village when I go back to Telangana, that the, the, there has been a lot more integration that has happened uh, in terms of both through market and technology. Therefore, this whole earlier idea of high culture and low culture, I think, have just collapsed. And Europe went through that process 50 years back. I think India is currently going through this process that there is no high and low culture. People may not be able to afford. I mean, Bombay is a very good example of this, that you know, fashion quotient of Bombay. Uh, is fairly high. People may not be able to afford a Gucci bag, but you can buy a look-alike bag. You know, that's a, that's a good uh, make-do. You, know, you should all watch that movie, Gucci, where, you know, they have this dialogue that uh, the, the younger Skion is worried that uh, so many look-alike Gucci bags are selling on the wayside, but the old one says that it's good, let them buy, but the rich will only buy the original. So there is no threat <laughs> of... But the point is that if you travel in Delhi now, uh, you know, I travel from my South Delhi place to JNU, there are you know, lower middle class colonies. I watch those girls, young girls and boys, all of them with uh, low cut jeans and uh, you know, with Gucci lookalike bags hanging with a mobile phone they're all carrying. So I think technology in, and market in Indian context, uh, they're empowering. You know, people can claim at least to, they know where they need to belong, they know what are the recent fashion trends. So this earlier business that you had a high culture, and you had then the low culture, uh, I think, no longer works. People, it has got fairly democratized. Fashion trends, technologies have got, I think, fairly uh, democratized. You know, technology, mobile phone, I think, has, has been a liberating force. It has been the new god. You know, after Nietzsche said, God is dead, the new god is the mobile phone. You find literally everyone, whatever class, caste they belong to, uh, mobile is a very dignifying uh, you know, equipment that people hold on to. No, one should raise why. I think because if you look at photography, you know, that's a very interesting thing that earlier, you, f to be a good photographer, you, you, you were told that you had to capture a unique movement. But today with mobile phones, you don't capture a unique movement. You create unique movements. You know, so, so everybody can be a good photographer if you have a good quality uh, mobile phone. So that's what I mean when I say that this access to technology, access to market uh, uh, consumption patterns. You know, David Harvey, a geographer, says that Netflix, he refers to Netflix as a non-exclusionary uh, commodity. 
That is, if one is consuming it, it doesn't exclude the others. People simultaneously can use, consume uh, Netflix. So I think this kind of new Netflix kind of thing, I think I've evened out, I've made things more flatter. The people in my, uh, you know, uh, a lower middle class and what we watch in TV are today pretty much the similar serials. You know, they are not very, very different. People are watching uh, those who come from even I talk to my students who come from officials, they're all watching South Korean serials, they're watching Turkish serials, they're watching Pakistani serials. So it's, it's a great uh, you know, social uh, uh, leveler and democratizer. Third, I think, is uh, democracy. Third great potential force of social democratization is the, the very electoral process, that the fact that it has a deep value of one person, one value. This whole ethic of one person, one value, that whether you are rich or poor, with whatever caste you might belong to, on the day of election, it doesn't matter. Every person carries the same. That's why, you see, India is, in that sense, very unique, that one, we are the, perhaps one of the few countries in the world where, in spite of all the crisis in de governance and democracy, voter turnout is increasing every year. Look at recent Karnataka elections, it is well over 74%. Look at Chhattisgarh and state central India where you have so-called Maoist movement which is calling for boycott of elections, voter turnout is well over 75%. So the, our average is almost now 70% of voter turnout. The people heavily invest in electoral politics, uh, not because they think you know, governments are going to respond and do some magic, but this ethic behind it that you know on that day of election you are equal to everyone else you know you don't bother whether it's status or whether it is tendulkars you are the same we all go out and vote as citizens you know so democracy i think in this political in the sense of this ethic uh, has been a great uh, leveler but as the process of social democratization has been deepening post 1990s with global economic reforms, with neoliberalism, with structural adjustment, with market fundamentalism taking over our social life, I think there has been a deep shrinking of economic opportunities and exponential rise of economic inequalities. So I feel that this tension between, on one hand, there's a heavy consciousness of social democratization. You feel you're equal in terms of gender or in terms of caste or in terms of other social indicators. But in terms of concrete material opportunities, there are people out there who cannot translate this imagination into a reality. That you face everyday indignities uh, because of your poor economic opportunities. That you can't afford good schooling, you can't afford a good job, you can't afford a healthy meal, you can't afford uh, no, uh, up-to-date technology. And people are deeply conscious this, this. People are aware what they're missing out on. You now, there was a generation like my parents, you know, who, who are simply not aware. I take my father to a very expensive restaurant, he will order the same food that he eats at home. <laughs> he wouldn't mind which food, how expensive. He simply, he doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, it's not a marker for them. You know, I keep telling, you know, I brought you to, I make it a point telling him I brought you to a very good restaurant. He doesn't sink in, <laughs> it doesn't matter what the bill is. But today's generation, we are all very conscious. We know what are those layers, what are the difference, you know, which car, automobiles, you know, the entire advertisement industry is sped. So I think there is a deep stress, social stress that is created through this unevenness. That you are socially, you feel competent and equal, but economic opportunities are, are deeply uneven, are deeply, deeply very un unequal. This, I think, produces what in my work I call as the new political subjectivity. This is one big source for rise of illiberal civic socialization. People have become, so people need to compensate this unevenness in their everyday life. You know, this is an everyday existential indignity you're facing. You know, you're very aware, but you know the, the mobile you're carrying is not an up-to-date mobile. You know, I carry, still I carry the old Nokia. And, uh, you know, and my, my, my students ask me, sir, kis chor bazaar se aap leke hai ye kaha milta hai aajkal? So, so just to make a point that people can still, you know, live a dignified life without the up-to-date. But uh, my students think this is a bizarre thing I do, that I'm not on WhatsApp, I'm not on Twitter, 
uh, they say, sir, you, you are missing a lot of action out there. But people face this every day. You know, if you're not up to date, if you're not carrying a Mac, you know, I see the younger generation, they're completely aware, you know, official, those who come from official towns, uh, the kind of stress they feel in common spaces like universities, you know, when they are comparing with others who live, you know, kind of clothing. No, earlier a shirt was a shirt, but today we are aware, you know, there is linen, what not, what brand, you know, we are all very deeply, deeply aware. And people who can't afford are even more aware than the rest of those who can afford. You know, they know the layered reality of you know, what is available in the market. This, I think, to a big extent globally has contributed to uh, aggression. That this aggressive behavior, I feel, what we, you know, for us looks as a very visible growth of intolerance, as a visible growth of hatred, as a visible growth of illiberality uh, comes from this tension. That, you know, people are, this is a one way people cope with. Similarly, one can dig into it. There are a lot of formulations that I make in my writings in terms of how to understand this. You know, people are forced to also fantasize. But how do you know? You have to fantasize uh, uh, being equal to others. Because simply in reality, you know what the reality is very harsh and very stark, and you know that, that that indignity hits you very hard. But it's only an escape route in fantasy that you cope and imagine that you are equal to the other person. Therefore, it also leads to kind of projected victimhood. You know, all this dominant caste from Patidars to Jats to Gujars today demanding reservation. They're saying, claiming that we are the most you know, highly victimized. You know, in fact, when Brahmins in India claim we are persecuted and ostracized. You know, we are the losers. So every caste, in one sense, is beginning to feel this deep victimhood. You know, and that partly that hyper claim of victimhood also comes from this generic condition of unevenness between your social awareness, your social status, and your shrinking economic opportunities. I think part of support for totalitarian, authoritarian leaders and demagogueries comes from this tension. That we see that realization, self-realization of this, uh, our own existential you know, incompetence, you know, failure, we see it realized in uh, strong, strong men. In populist, populism, we refer to this phenomenon of strong men, somebody who is very strong, somebody who is very masculine. So that, I think, is a compensatory mechanism. For, uh, therefore, if we want to, we simply cannot afford to dismiss this entire celebration of strong men uh, as merely some kind of a growing hatred or intolerance. If you want to address that growing illiberality, you'll have to address this underlying social reality of unevenness between social, that democracies have successfully instilled social democratization, but democracies have also turned neoliberal post 1990s in Indian case, which have also exacerbated uh, economic uh, inequalities. My third point is the question that all of us, I think, debate day in and day night for the last 10 years, is secularism dead? Again, my broad argument is that old terms and old imagination of secularism uh, does not work. I think that, that categories are the same, but uh, we'll have to raise this whole question. Therefore, I, I'm not a great champion of going back and referring to Nehruvian secularism or abstract idea of constitution, abstract celebration of democracy. I think that's not going to get us out of the kind of majority and impasse that we are facing. We need to move on. I mean, they raised, whether it's Nehru, whether it's Gandhi or Ambedkar, raised questions that were relevant and complex in their own times. And I think in the last 50, 60 odd years, societies have changed beyond recognition. So they were raising questions that were universal to their times, but we cannot simply take their ideas and think that they will provide us ready-made solutions to problems that we are facing in the current times. We'll have to re-signify, transform their ideas, engage with them, but I don't think the ideas that as they are present in their writings are directly relevant to the questions we are... So the secularism is one such good crisis, one such big crisis we are facing across the globe again, nothing specific to India. To understand why secularism is in crisis or to even begin to understand what does the crisis of secularism actually mean, you should all take a look at the Pew Research Survey, you know, the New York-based research organization a uh, couple of years back conducted one of the largest surveys 
and the title of the survey was uh, a toler uh, uh, India and its tolerance. You know, it was a, based on the tolerance survey that how tolerant is uh, India, and they came up with some very fascinating uh, findings. This was a survey cutting across caste. This was a survey cutting across uh, uh, metropolitans and mofficials. This was a caste, uh, uh, survey cutting across religious denomination. They interviewed Hindus, Muslims, and Christians. Invariably, all of them said that we all value diversity. We value diversity as an abstract value. But they said, when it comes to concrete everyday living, we do not want to co cohabit together. We do not want Muslims in our areas. Christians would say we do not want Hindus in our areas. The report's formulation is, India is now proponent of living together separately. They say that it's good for India to have Hindus, Muslims, and Christians. It's good to have this religious diversity. It is good to have linguistic diversities. It is good to have regional diversities. They all realize this is very good for democracy. Very interesting. And you know, a startling revelation of this survey is that those who have voted for BJP, in fact, value diversity higher than those who have not voted for BJP. But they all believe beneath that, as an abstract value, as an ethical value, diversity is celebrated. That's the imagination of India we all have. But when it comes to the concrete, they said that we don't want to live with people of other religions and castes. How, how does one, one even begin to understand this kind of a new social reality? Does this mean we have become secular in a different way? And what should be our notion of secularism in this context? I think part of the crisis of those who are pitching for secularism against this kind of religious majoritarian orders, whether in Turkey, whether in white working class in, in United States, whether even in Europe with a new Christian uh, you know, identity, uh, kind of a renewal of new Christian identity, is that we are not very clear as to what we mean by secularism. By secularism, for instance, are we meaning that we should have common cohabitation of religious groups under common neighborhoods? Do we mean by secularism we should encourage interreligious marriages? We don't know. We are all very confused, you know, that uh, you know, we, at the most we say it's about individual choice. Or we would say we have a minimalist idea of secularism would mean that basic social guarantees to religious minorities. Beyond this, we are not very clear in terms of what is the direction at least we need to push. You know, like Ambedkar was very clear in anti-caste, he said inter-dining and inter-marriage is a concrete strategy to break caste system. But when it comes to inter-religious, should we also that we should encourage actively inter-religious marriages to make India more secular? I think that will be a very startling thing. You know, I was in on the invite of Muslim Education Society in Kerala, Malapuram, a couple of years back, uh, and they, they introduced me with a lot in bombastic terms, and they said, sir, you should come every year to our college. And in course of my talk on secularism, I said that we should imbibe Ambedkar's philosophy in terms of interreligious marriage, and trust me, I have not been invited since then to MES. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I don't think even minorities would want to see interreligious marriage as a way out uh, from this current impasse. So I think that there's a deep conceptual, ethical crisis of imagination. We really do not know at what level we are talking about in terms of this solidarity. We would want to preserve identities as they exist. That is what has also been the experience of uh, Europe. You know, Europe had the idea of secularism till 70s, 80s, which broadly meant separation of politics and uh, religion, which meant certain guarantees of uh, civil and political and social rights to religious minorities. But after 70s, they moved to multiculturalism. They said this abstract notion of secularism does not work. We need to have multiculturalism, which would mean a possible recognition by the state of cultural diversities. And what did that multiculturalism translate into? You know, when I was in Denmark, you know, five, six years back, you know, a friend of mine took me out for a walk in uh, Copenhagen. He said, let's go for a walk, I'll show you around how Copenhagen looks. Then he said, this is white colony. Then we walked, then he said, this is South Asian colony. Then he said, this is 
Hispanics, this is Bangladeshi. For my Indian sensibilities, that was very shocking. That to have such clearly demarcated, you know, habitations. And I said, India may not be at the top, but even we do not have this kind of very clearly demarcated. You know, if you go walk across Mumbai, uh, you wouldn't say that this is a place where Bangladeshis live. This is a place where, you know, certain people of certain caste live or certain religion. We are heading in that direction. But that's extremely discomforting for our uh, Indian sensibilities. But Europeans thought this was a good idea. That multiculturalism meant people live with their own cultural groupings and that would need to some stability and, you know, peace and familiarity. This is what, you know, uh, uh, Slavokian philosopher Zizek says, this is racism at a distance. That is, you discriminate by people by keeping them at a distance. You know, that you segregate them in such a way that, uh, which is what is happening with Indian Muslims today, that you want to segregate them and you say that this is perfectly all right because different caste and religious groups want to live within familiar atmosphere. Why at all have uh, cohabitation? So Europe itself, in spite of its enlightenment, had this kind of a long legacy of multiculturalism which led to social ghettoization of groups, that they could not uh, possibly imagine uh, robust uh, intercultural mixing, that the only way they could preserve identities was through social distancing and social ghettoization, which is what India is going through. So secularism, multiculturalism, all ended up uh, in places that, uh, that have created great discomfort, unless you want to uh, do a counterintuitive reading like sociologist uh, Ashish Nandi does. You know, Nandi once visited Kochi and he said, Kochi is the most secular society in Kerala. And he said, why? Because there are Hindus, Muslims and Christians in almost approximately same number with equal social and economic power and all three communities hate each other. <laughs> but they all know that one cannot do anything to the other, so they live peacefully. So he said it is extreme dislike which is a source of peace. So unless you want to do this kind of a counterintuitive reading of what is good about you know, uh, social ghettoization, I think one big uh, crisis of uh, those of us who are talking about making India more secular would be to raise this question of what Dr. Ambedkar said, his emphasis on fraternity. That today I think there is a context where we need to read, uh, we need to have more concrete social imagination of what this fraternity would actually mean. And how is that we are going to balance the demands of fraternity with the urge of uh, social caste and religious groups to preserve their own identities. You know, where do we draw the lines? You know, right is very clear that they want segregated identities and they want hierarchical arrangement. One of the advantages with right is absolute clarity. And a big disadvantage with our project is we are completely confused. And part of the confusion is this, that we do not know how far to push solidarity. Because this question of, for instance, interreligious marriage could well mean that minorities might feel this is one way that you were going to kind of colonize their identities. So they wouldn't you know, be happy with. So what other forms can we think of in terms of if secularism uh, in our popular imagination means greater fraternal feelings between religious and caste communities, uh, what should be its concrete social form? I think we are absolutely not clear about that. Part of that confusion is what comes across as this growing illiberality and uh, intolerance. My fourth point quickly would be, I think we have moved to an age of emotions. Yeah. We have 20th century, as many of you know, have, uh, was referred by Eric Hobsbawm as age of revolutions. I think 21st century, I would call it, is an age of emotions. I think a whole range of new way of social life has come about where uh, uh, there's a different existential issues that have emerged in the public and political realm. You know, at one point we were calculating development through GDP, and then we said that's not a good idea. Amartya Sen said GDP does not you know, account for social development, so we need capabilities approach. Then we moved to social development index. But today we are looking at happiness index. We are raising this question of what is a good life? That you know, you might have socially and economically developed countries, but those are not necessarily happy countries. You know, Japan is a highly industrialized country, but Tokyo is called the suicide capital of the world. They are suffering from celibacy syndrome. 
you know. I don't know how many of you are following, but United Kingdom, a couple of years back, has officially inaugurated Ministry of Loneliness. Loneliness is now an epidemic in much of Europe. Social transformation itself is bringing newer questions which are very, very existential in nature. And these cannot be captured through legal rationality, through institutional logic, through economic questions of redistributive justice. These are very hands-on existential issues that people are facing. And this is, I think, clearly visible all across the globe. Some of my friends in UK have written that one of the reasons for rise of populism across the globe, they say, is the rise of global regimes of boredom. That people are extremely bored in today's life. Life has become very repetitive. There is a pervasive sense of anomaly and meaninglessness. Uh, so boredom, he says, as against excitement and intensification, uh, uh, is one big reason of a crisis of uh, modernity. So I can go on to the range of emotions that, that I think today have become the way people relate to collective life. And this cannot be captured through old discourses of social development, economic indicators, secularism, state, law, so on and so forth. This would need that we need to, and I think one thing that right always does is that I think they are comfortable with this idea of mobilizing on the base of emotions. Of course, the, the, the kind of emotions that they mobilize, we are, we are uncomfortable with. But again, we should not throw the baby with the bathwater that, you know, that are we uncomfortable with the kind of emotions that right is mobilizing or are we uncomfortable with the very idea of bringing emotions into public domain. I think emotions have always existed. We always shied away. We thought institutions and constitutions are big check. But today's nature of existential issues, some of which I have mentioned, the loneliness, boredom, fear, anxiety, are all up in the public domain. And therefore, a big question that globally that is being de uh, discussed is that should state directly mobilize around questions of emotions, ethics, and values? Our general sense is that it is going to lead to a very liberal society because we often think that these are very personal, private issues. Many of us have to handle these questions of emotion, emotional dissonance uh, in a private sense. But today there is a kind of a collective cultural trauma that is very, very visible. You know, that, uh, the way, for instance, partition memory is being revived in this country is, is, is a question of collective emotions that are being mobilized. Therefore, the fourth question that I raise for your consideration is that uh, emotions themselves are not illiberal. Emotions themselves are not irrational. Emotions are also deeply evaluative. They're not merely unreflective you know, uh, experiences that human beings have, that we also evaluate social, our own personal life through emotions, right? So fourth question would be, how do we, what would it mean for progressive, left, secular uh, uh, parties and societies to kind of mobilize alternate emotions? You know, what would those alternate emotions be against the kind of emotions we're witnessing? It could be care, it could be compassion, it could be love. And our mythologies, myths, I think, are all full of examples of uh, uh, ethics of compassion, care, uh, alongside things that might be objectionable. So how are we going to intervene? What kind of alternative mobilization? E can we have policies based on this? Now, if you look at uh, national education policy, it is very, very clear. It says that modern education is not merely about developing cognitive abilities and critical thinking, but it is about giving emotions. It is developing people, to allowing them to people to reflect. I think it's a very powerful idea. That it, because if you look at education very closely, for deep interpersonal everyday problems that we face, our education is literally irrelevant. It simply doesn't help you to you know people with depression, people with emotional dissonance, with the interpersonal fights we have with our partners. Our education says next to nothing. You are left on your own. You are, you know, and that is the place where right is intervening. That's where they are saying what is right and wrong, so on and so forth. They of course have a very controlled idea of morality. That might be a problem. But I think this is a zone where a modern secular uh, has to intervene if you do not want that kind of rise of illiberality. I'm almost running out of time. Purva has already given some. I will conclude quickly with my last point on problem of valuation that we're facing is that there is a terrible uh, 
a fluidity of identities that has also happened. You know, that modernity has also brought uh, fluidity of identities. Uh, I think we are moving away from those stable identities of men and women, rich and poor, Brahmin and Dalit. These were stable conflicts. They were conflicts, but these were at least assuringly stable conflicts. I think for days for that kind of old conflicts are, are past. And we are facing, we are into a new situation where there are multiplicity of identities proliferating. Like if you take Dalits, there are conflicts within intra-Dalit conflicts, sub-caste conflicts are happening. If you take Muslims, there is a question of Pasmanda Muslims. There is a question of gender. If you take rich and poor, there is a question of multiple layers of middle class itself. Today we are defining in terms of multiple layers, upper middle class, middle, middle, and lower middle. So every class, there is a multiplicity of identities. What this multiplicity of identities does is that it creates what I call the problem of valuation. That is, we do not know who is above and who is below. The old conflicts at least had stability. We know Brahmins are above, Dalits are below, it's considered below in the social hierarchy, you know what to fight. You know that Hindus are above, majority Muslims are below, you know what to fight. But in this new context that we are facing, with the proliferation of identities, if I might ask you a few questions like, how would you compare an OBC man uh, with a poor upper caste woman? Who would you value above and who would you value below? I can go on. I have a number of examples of this kind. And I think part of the reason we have this idea of post-truth, fake news, rise of perceptions, irrelevance of data and evidence is because we really do not know how to value these things. So women think up, up, uh, no, OBC are men after all, so they are more powerful. OBC men think these are upper caste women, privileged after all, never seen caste discrimination, so they think they are much above. If you talk about Dalits and Muslims, there is no concrete way we can evaluate. Muslims think that we are the ones ostracized, Dalits think that we are the ones who experience untouchability, Muslims have never, they have in fact been ruling elites of this country. It is this quantum of problem of valuation that the right today mobilizes in terms of toxic you know, fake news, creation of perceptions. So if you simply look at fake news, post-truth, perceptions as something right-wing political propaganda strategy, you will never get to the bottom of the problem. You have to tell us this problem of valuation is a real big-time sociological problem. And we even we do not know how to value them because you know, gender and caste, we do not know how to value which comes first, which comes second. Because women sometimes face no, even if they're upper caste, if they're socially privileged, they sometimes face domestic violence. Dalit men may not face that kind of violence, but they face untouchability. Now, how will you value domestic violence versus untouchability? If you look at a scheme like EWS, it is precisely geared towards based on those kinds of built-in perceptions. So I think these are the five, if we can take on board and build an alternative political and social discourse, that is when I think we can defeat illiberalism globally. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience.